Hi, good day everyone and welcome to our YouTube channel. Thanks for subscribing to our channel, we really appreciate you. Today we quickly want to take a rundown on all of the specimens that NECO has released to use for their biology practical this year. So we'll quickly take a rundown on all of the specimens. We talk about, we list the specimens. We talk about certain characteristics of the specimen and possible questions that you'll be seeing or coming across in the course of the exam. So I'll plead with every one of us to try as much as possible to watch what we want to do and listen unto all of that, all that will be said in the course of this uh, lesson. Thank you very much. So we'll quickly take a rundown on all of the specimen by listing them. So we'll be starting with specimen A. Specimen A. Specimen A happens to be the land snail. Specimen A. Land snail. That is our specimen A. While our specimen B is toad. Specimen B is toad. Our specimen C is spider. Specimen C is spider. And specimen D happens to be crayfish. The specimen D is crayfish. While the specimen E is spirogyra filament. The spirogyra filament. That is our specimen E. And our specimen F, we have our specimen F to be the muco or rhizopus. Muco rhizopus. And then specimen G, we have specimen G to be groundnut seedling. Groundnut seedling seedling of not more than a week old and specimen H is the maize seedling maize seedling also not more than a week old and then specimen I is the microscope we have specimen I to be microscope specimen J is slide Specimen J is slide, slide for the microscope, slide that is used on the microscope. Specimen K is the pigeon. Specimen K is pigeon. Then specimen L. Specimen L is a gamma lizard. A gamma lizard is our specimen L. Then specimen M is rat we're talking about rats while specimen n which is going to be the last specimen is tilapia tilapia sorry tilapia so these are the list of specimen that neko has chosen for neko 2023 biology practical a for uh, specimen A, we have land snail. Specimen B, we have toad. Specimen C is spider. Specimen D is crayfish. Specimen E is pyrogyra filament. Specimen F is muco rhizopus. Specimen G is groundnut seedling. While specimen H is maize seedling. Specimen I is microscope. Specimen J is slide. Specimen K is pigeon. Specimen L is agama lizard. Specimen M is rat, while specimen N is tilapia fish. So we'll quickly be looking at all of these specimen one after the other. We'll be talking about certain characteristics of all of these uh, specimens, some of them that have certain properties. So we'll look at all of these according to, uh, or uh, talking about all of the uh, specimen one after the other. So not wasting much of our time, let us go straight to the first specimen so starting with specimen a now we're starting with specimen a specimen a so that is where we want to pick it up from so let us see what is our specimen a we said our specimen a is the land snail 
the land snail so this is what the picture of the land snail looks like you can see this this is what the picture of the land snail looks like so we can see how it looks with the tentacles and the eyes here on the head on the tentacles these are the tentacles we have two tentacles and so this is going to be the foot and the shell of the snail so on this tentacle we have the eyes of the snail so that is what the land snail is so what are the characteristics that we can talk about of the land snail let us start by writing the land snail land snail so let us quickly see its botanic its uh, scientific name we have it to be helix helix pomatia helix pomatia is its botanical name that is the botanical name for land snail so let us see it is a terrestrial gastropoda it is a mollusk it is a terrestrial gastropoda it lives on land uh, and it is an organism that has shell that is why it is referred to as a mollusk though we have some of these uh, uh, gastropods that are not with shells those that are not with shells example we have the slugs the slugs look like snails but they do not have shells that is the distinguishing feature between the snails or the land snail and the slug the snails have shells while the land snails i mean while the slugs do not have shells so the original ancestors of snails they are originally from uh the marine waters that is salt water that is where the ancestors the original ancestors of snails that is where they came from that is their origin so majorly they are pulmonates pulmonate that is organism that have lungs for air they possess lungs that help them to breathe so they are referred to as Pulmonate, so they under they, they they also exhibit the pulmonary uh, circulation uh, system. So that is why we call them the pulmonate. So majorly they are hermaphrodites. Yes, they are hermaphrodites. That is why they really do not require the assistance of any organism when it comes to reproduction. So they can easily reproduce by themselves. That is what it is. So the the type of reproduction that we have in the uh, in the helix pomatia which is the land snail is uh self reproduction that is because they are what hermaphrodites they possess the two uh gamete cells in them also when they move by gliding along on their muscular foot they possess muscular foot yes this part that i showed you earlier on this part here underneath this place here that is what that is directly on the leaf as you can see in this particular picture you can see here something underneath here that is this is their muscular foot so it is laying directly on this green leaf so that part laying directly on the green leaf is what we refer to as the muscular foot and it is slimy in nature because it possesses uh it, it possesses mucus it, it it has lubricating uh, mucus it is lubricated by mucus that helps to what gives these uh, snails the ability to glide along their paths and they are covered with cilia to reduce friction yes cilia is uh, a movement organelle it helps or it aids movement so it is found on the uh, the, the the muscular foot of the of the snails so it prevents or reduces friction the shells are rich in calcium so let me quickly put down uh, some of these points that I've uh, talked about now I said one that they are terrestrial gastropodas yes because they live on land so we refer to them as terrestrial gastropods and they are also mollusks they are also mollusks because they possess because they have the possession of shells possession of shells unlike the shell unlike sn uh, slugs unlike slugs without shell so that is the difference between the between the snail 
and the slug. I also said that their original ancestors are marine in nature. Original ancestors. Original ancestors are marine. That is, they have they come from the salt water. Yes, that is the original ancestor for the land snail. And then I said they are pulmonates. Yes, majorly pulmonates. Because, okay, let me put it this way they are pulmonates. That is, possess the possess lungs. The possess lungs for air or respiration. So that is why we refer to them as pulmonates. Also, I said that they are hermaphrodites. Yes, that is another characteristic that I made mention of. Majorly hermaphrodites. So they do not need the, uh, the help of any other organism to reproduce. They can self. They can self reproduce. Yes. Also, I said that they move by gliding along on their muscular foot. Yes. Movement is by gliding. Movement. Is by gliding on their muscular foot. Yes, they move along on their muscular foot, which is lubricated, lubricated by mucus or lubricated with mucus. Also, it is covered. It is also covered with cilia, which I said earlier on that it is uh, a movement organelle with cilia to reduce friction. I believe we are getting what we are saying. I'm writing this note so we can have time to go through them and understand what has actually been discussed. Yes, I said this shell, the shells of snails. Shell is very rich in calcium carbonate. Is rich in calcium carbonate. Yes, which is rich in calcium carbonate, and they possess one or two pairs of tentacles on the head. Yes. Possess one or two pairs. One or two pairs of tentacles on the head. Yes, and it is these tentacles that bear the eyes. So the eyes are carried, that is what I'm saying now. Eyes, eyes are carried. On the first set of the tentacles, of the first set of the tentacles. Yes. So the snails hibernate during winter. Yes, when there is winter, when there is too much cold, the wind, the snails, they hibernate. Snails hibernate during the hibernate during winter also they estivate during summer all right and estivate during summer when there is excessive heat so they do that by uh, 
stay they, okay they stay moist during hibernation they stay moist during hibernation and the seed uh, the shell opens with dry layer of mucus so these are the things that we have for uh the specimen a which is the land snail so if you look at this this is an example so this is how the snail looks you can see it this is how it looks and per adventure you are asked to draw or to label what the shell looks like what the snail looks like this is what you are expected to do so when you're told to draw what the snail looks like and to draw and label this is what the diagram of a shell of a snail looks like you can see it has the hole that is this shell having the uh the coily you can see how it looks the coily form then that's the shell then around here it has something called the pneumosphere and then the mantle directly under the shell which attaches this uh the the foot of the shell of the snail to the shell and then we have the head and here we have the tentacles you can see the tentacles that carries the eyes at the tip here so these are the upper tentacles and we have lower tentacles as well so these are referred to as the first set of tentacles and these ones are the two, uh, second set of tentacles underneath here is where we have the mouth and then we have the muscular foot so that is what the snail is about so that is that about the land snail which is our specimen a so let us go to the next specimen the next specimen specimen b is toad specimen b specimen b is toad so that is our specimen b toad is our specimen b so what do we have for toad all right let us see the botanical name or the scientific name sorry the scientific name for toad is bufo americanus it's called bufo americanus that is the scientific name for uh toad so toad belongs to the kingdom animalia or the phylum codata let me just put them here belongs to the kingdom animalia the kingdom is animalia and the phylum is codata you could be asked then the class is amphibia the class is amphibian and so we have the order to be anora order is anora we have the family to be buffonide family is buffonide that is what the family of toad is and then we have the genus to be buffo and the uh species to be americanus that is what makes up the botanical i mean the scientific name of that particular organism yes this particular organism let me quickly show us the picture of what i am talking about all right this is what i'm saying we can see this is what a toad looks like we can see that on this this particular species it doesn't have very very smooth back unlike this that we can see here we can see this particular one here this particular one this one has more or less a smooth back but that one that i showed us earlier on this one doesn't have very very smooth back so we can see that is one of the characteristic difference between uh the toad and the frog so let us quickly see what the, the toad is it is a terrestrial organism yes because it lives on land it is a terrestrial organism and it is nocturnal meaning it's okay lives on land i also said that it is nocturnal meaning it is found mostly in the night 
nocturnal organism yes so it is a nocturnal organism so it is very very active at night active at night yes that is why it is referred to as a nocturnal organism they possess thick dry and often watery skin that is what i said earlier on if you look at this picture they possess their back is very very thick it is dry and it is what watery in nature yes you can see that it has patches on them so all of these that i'm talking about all of these patches these things that we seen on the back is is what we are referring to as the watery skin with mottled brown uh, patches so i said that it has or it possesses thick back thick dry dry often watery often watery sorry often watery skin yes on the back and this skin is mottled in brown color so that is how their skin looks so it's, it's it really differentiates them from the frogs frogs do not have watery skin the skin of the frog is usually very very uh smooth also they possess uh poison secreting glands yes possession yes possession of it has possession of poison secreting glands possession of poison secreting glands yes that is another characteristic of the uh toads and these poison secreting glands they are located on the back that is at the back of the of this of the toad somewhere around this place here that is where the poison secreting gland is located somewhere around here so that is where it is located on the back in the what and they are concentrated in two prominent rest areas that is when there is the need for it to be expelled the the the, the poison secreting gland secretes it and it transports it to the back of the eyes here that is where we have we find the uh the gland the the poison there that place is called the parotid gland this part behind the the eyes where this this place here where you have the gland that is where we have directly behind the eyes is where we have the parotid uh gland that is where the uh the poison is being secreted or is being concentrated before it is being expelled so this place here is what we refer to as the the parotid gland so i said the possession of poison secreting glands in the back in the back and then concentrated concentrated in two prominent areas concentrated in two prominent areas yes and they are found behind the eyes prominent areas behind the eyes and this part here you can see they are found behind the eyes and those part they are referred to as the, the we call them the uh the parotic gland that is what we refer to them as the parotic gland so it is important that we understand that called the parotic the parotid the, sorry the parotid parotid gland that is what that part is called the parotid gland so we should know what it is and what its function is it's very very important it is secreted when the toad is molested or threatened that is when we find this parotid gland 
uh, emitting the substance. It is secreted when the toad is threatened or molested. And when this happens, the poison irritates the eyes and the mucor membrane of the predators. Yes, that is what the poison does. Okay, ah, uh, this particular poison is secreted. Poison is secreted when molested or threatened. Yes, poison irritates the eyes of predators. It can cause temporal paralysis okay. can cause temporary paralysis in some organism or even death that is how poisonous the uh, or oh, that is how toxic rather the poison of the toad are so it can cause temporal paralysis or even lead to death yes toads lay eggs they lay eggs toads lay eggs they lay eggs so they are referred to as oviparous they are oviparous organisms, so they lay eggs and they lay as much as 600 to even as high as 30,000 eggs every time they lay their eggs, depending on the species of uh, the toad. And they lay them in two long jelly tubes. In two long jelly tubes. That is how they lay their eggs and when they lay their eggs their eggs hatch into tadpoles eggs hatch the eggs hatch into tadpoles Sorry, let me quickly do this right. Eggs hatch into tadpoles. That is after about uh, one to three months. Oh, well, they hatch into tadpoles and then they transform into adults in about one to three months, into tadpoles and to adults in about three months yes and then we also said that they have possession of vocal sacs yes possession that is why we hear their sound in the night possession of vocal sacs Yes, this sack give them the sound resonating or the sound resonating truth pouch. Sound resonating truth pouch. Yes, that is what it is. So we can see an example of that here. It is found here. This is where we have in the neck here in the neck region. That is where we have the uh, the sound resonating truth pouch. So. They pump, they pump air from within their stomach, from their abdomen. They pump the air into that, uh, that resonating truth pouch. And that is how they expel the sound. So this is what a toad looks like. So peradventure you are told to distinguish between a toad and a frog. Now, this is how they, they reproduce, they mate. You can see the female frog carrying the male, I mean, sorry, the female toad. Or majorly this is how the amphibians generally toad and frogs this is how they reproduce the male toad is being carried this is the male toad here is being carried by the female toad the female toad is usually underneath while the male toad is above it so that is how 
they reproduce when they lay eggs then the uh the male toad uh releases sperm cells on it so that happens and then if you are told or if you are asked to differentiate between a toad and a frog these are the differences the major differences that you can have between them so this is another species of the toad you can see that this one is buffo regularis so this is another species of the toad so uh they are gen they are uh genus they are genus like i said earlier on we i mean from the family we have it to be buffonide so their genus is buffo that is why we have this one here then the species is the regularis so we need to understand that so if you are told to distinguish between a frog and a toad we can see some of the distinguishing features the toad have rough white uh, skin uh, on their back unlike the frog which have what, uh, smooth back are we together so those are the uh, major differences that you can see between the frog and the toad we can also see a picture of the frog here when you are told to label so please look at the diagrams very well so please that is what we have for uh the toad which is our specimen b are we together the toad which is our specimen b that is what we have for it so we need to understand that and move to the next specimen our next specimen is specimen c which is spider so specimen sorry specimen c and that is spider yes specimen c is spider so what does specimen c uh, what 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 can we say about specimen c also let us start by giving us its uh classification it is from the kingdom animalia the phylum is atropoda Phylum Atropoda, we have the class to be Arachnidae. The Arachnida, then the other, the other, we have it to be Arane. We have the other to be Arane. Uh, also, we have, uh, okay. Majorly the genus, it is the Arane. So that is what we call, that is the scientific uh, name for it, Arane. That is its scientific name. So that is what the scientific name is. So what are the characteristics that we want to talk about when we look at the spider? When we talk about the spider, we'll be looking at uh, the appendages that it has. Okay, so let's pick it up from there. Together, it has uh, six appendages. Yes, it has six appendages that uh, resort to fangs. Possession of eight legs. That is four pairs of legs. Yes, let's start with that. That is why they are actually called uh, uh, arthropods. Possession of possession of four pairs of walking legs now please some questions will tell you to list or tell the number of the legs if the, if they are, if you are asked to uh, mention the number of the legs the number of the legs is eight but if you are told to tell the pairs of legs it has four pairs of walking legs then six pairs of appendages possession of six pairs of appendages this leads to the fangs yes also the contract the, co the construct webs yes that is one major uh, uh thing that the the okay before we go to that this uh uh arthropods they have two segmented bodies they have two segmented bodies
possession of two segmented bodies yes and the bodies that they have they have the cephalothorax or it is also called uh, the prosoma they have the cephalothorax or the prosoma that is the head and then they also have the abdomen so this is one we have the one and two so those are the two segmented bodies they have the head which is the, what's the it is also called the cephalothorax or the prosoma and then the abdomen so that is that so i said earlier on that they construct webs yes spiders construct construct webs and what do they use their webs to do they use their web to trap flying insects construct webs to trap flying insects yes they trap flying insects why why do they trap flying insects because they are carnivorous in nature because because the spiders are carnivorous in nature that means they feed on insects they are carnivorous in nature so they they, they trap the uh, insects uh, and then they ingest them with their venom they inject the venom into their prey to kill it quickly or to first use their silk to wrap it and to immobilize it yes so the, the, the spiders also have venoms spiders inject venoms into their prey to kill it or they use their web or they use their web or wasp they are sick to wrap it to wrap the prey thereby immobilizing it immobilizing it and then they can feast on it so that is how they actually are uh, feed yes so uh the females the female spiders are usually larger in size than the male spiders female spiders are larger than the male so you could be asked to differentiate between the female spider and the male spider that is one of the differences that you can have between them that the male spiders are smaller in size compared to the female spider so i said that they are majorly carnivorous yes they are carnivorous they feed on insects they lay eggs okay their legs are attached to the cephalothorax or the prosumer they have their forelimbs or their, li their limbs attached to the uh, cephalothorax legs are attached to the cephalothorax so we need to know that as well the legs are attached to the cephalothorax and then it has the cephalothorax contains the stomach or i mean the yes the cephalothorax now contains i was saying it earlier on that that is the head it contains the stomach and the brain that is where we have the stomach and the brain containing the stomach and the brain yes that is what it is and then the uh the abdomen now if the cephalothorax contains the head i mean 
the cephalothorax contains the stomach and the brain then what do we have in the abdomen abdomen contains the lungs yes the heart the reproductive organs etc yes so the the abdomen contains the lungs the heart the reproductive organs while the cephalothorax which is the head or the prosoma contains the stomach and the brain so that is what the spider is about so if we are told to uh, show what the spider looks like we can see from this picture here this here is the cephalothorax you can see so it is divided into two body parts the cephalothorax and the abdomen on the cephalothorax you can see in the middle here is where we have the cephal on the cephalothorax is where we have all of the legs you can see the legs this is one two three four and then on this other side we have five six seven eight so we say that it is four pairs this and this make the first pair this and this make the second pair this and this make the third pair then this and this make the last pair so on the cephalothorax here is where we now have the uh on the cephalothorax we have the the stomach and the brain while in the abdomen yeah that is where we have the lungs the heart the reproductive organs and the rest of those so that is what the spider looks like this is another diagram of the spider you can see this as well you can see the how the legs are being shaped you can see that all of the legs are attached to the cephalothorax are we together so this is here this here is the abdomen that is where we have the uh in here that is where we have the uh lungs the liver and the rest of those so let us see so that is that about the specimen c so let us go to uh specimen d the specimen d specimen d our specimen d our specimen d is crayfish sorry specimen d is crayfish or crayfish as we popularly call it yes its botanical name is astacida astacide that is its uh, scientific name so let us quickly do this its classification now kingdom animalia then the phylum it is also arthropoda it is also arthropoda please permit me to do this Atropoda, and then it's okay. Subphylum so now it is called a crustacea, and then we have the class, it is from the class Malacostrexia. and then we have the order you could be asked to do this that is why we are putting it out the capo the capoda that is the order and then the family is the family is astacoide and then we have the uh the, the genus which makes it the astacidae so that is what crayfish is so the crayfish they are mostly found in fresh water mostly found in fresh water that is where they are mostly found though we have some other uh, few of these crayfish that can be found in brackish water or marine waters 
Huh? So we have lo lobster, which looks more like uh, it is much bigger though. It is much bigger than the crayfish. It can be found in salt waters. Yes, so crayfish, as you have said, is found mostly in fresh water. It has its head joined with its uh, thorax. Head is joined with thorax. Head joined with thorax. Yes, the head is joined with thorax, like we can see here. This is a crayfish. So this is what it looks like. You can see, this is what the crayfish looks like. So that is what the uh, uh, this the crayfish looks like. So the head is joined with the thorax. So let us see. We said the head has sharp snouts with compound eyes on the movable stock. Yes, head has head has sharp snouts. Yes, it has sharp snouts with compound eyes. Yes, the eyes of the crayfish, they are compound in nature. And then they possess five pairs of walking legs. Unlike the spider that we discussed earlier on, they have four pairs. Uh, crayfish have five pairs. Possession of five pairs of walking legs. So... If you are told to list uh, to tell the number of legs, the total number of legs that they have, the crayfish has ten legs all together. So it has five pairs of walking legs, and then uh, the first pair, the first pair, the first pair of the legs are larger they have larger powerful pincers the first pair have larger powerful pincers powerful uh, pincers that are called the chile yes this is what i'm talking about here if we look at it here we have the four this is what i'm talking about this two here this one and this one if you count all together we have one two three four and this one which is the fifth one so this one here they have powerful pincers let's see another diagram that can show us what the pincers look like you can see them this is what the pincers look like you can see them here you can see so this one here it, it, it has claw, kind of. So it can open and close it. So that is why we call that part, we call it the powerful uh, pincer. So it has the ability to hold things. So that is the five legs. You can see the first one, then two, three, four, five. As you can see, that is listed here. So that is that. So those are the, uh, the legs that the crayfish has. Also, it has five pairs of smaller appendages on the abdomen possession of smaller appendages possession of smaller appendages on the abdomen so this is what I'm saying here if you look towards the abdomen here there are tiny appendages yes underneath here there are tiny uh close underneath the appendages here underneath the abdomen here we have tiny appendages so that is what we can see if you look at these ones here we can see all of these things this is one this is two this is three huh all of these tiny ones here they are called the appendages these ones that i'm talking about here they are called appendages they are found on the abdomen so those are the things that we have on the uh crayfish and now these appendages are used right on the abdomen used 
for swimming the appendages are used for swimming as well as circulating water for respiration for swimming and circulating water circulating water for respiration that is what we have uh, the appendages doing now they can grow this crayfish can grow as far as or they can grow to a length of about seven point to about seven point five centimeters that is about three inches that is about three inches long Sorry. They can grow up to about three inches in length, so it can go to three inches long. That is how far they can they can grow. Now they conceal themselves under rocks or uh, logs and they are highly rich in proteinous. Conceal themselves under rocks or logs in the fresh water. Yes, highly rich highly rich in proteins yes they are very very rich in proteins so like i said the lobsters are also uh, aquatic organisms but they are found mostly in the salt water the brackish water and they are much bigger larger, larger in size than the crayfish so i've shown us example of the pictures of the crayfish you can see them here this is crayfish you can see what it looks like and this is the diagram well labeled so let us go to the next specimen which is specimen e our specimen e specimen e men e the specimen e specimen e which happens to be spirogyra filaments sparogyra filaments that is our specimen g its uh, botanical name is spirogyra zygnemato this zygnemate That is its botanical name, Sparagira nignematales uh, or nignematale. That is its uh, botanical name. So, okay, please, lest I forget, while we're discussing uh, the uh, crayfish, so let me quickly show us a typical example of what the specimen when it is asked to be drawn let me quickly show us what it looks like when you are asked to draw the crayfish this is what a drawn example if you don't want to draw it like this this is a more labeled uh, diagram of the specimen uh, a, a more labeled diagram of specimen D which is the crayfish so let us continue to what we are talking about now which is pyrogeral filament the spirogyra filament is named for their beautiful spiral uh, chloroplast. This is what it looks like. The spirogyra filament looks like this. We have it looking like this. Sorry. 
spirogyra filament looks like this. This is what it looks like. This is how the spirogyra filament looks like. We have this. The spirogyra filament looking like this. So it has what we refer to as beautiful spiral chloroplast. You can see the uh, chloroplast inside it moving uh, to and flow. Mm? You can see it. This is the chloroplast. It is coiled like this. That is how it looks. You can see it. The filaments move like this. The chloroplast, it moves like this. So it has coily uh, filling. That is how it is. So we have the chloroplast in that form. So now, what are we looking at for the diagram? Uh, the characteristic of uh, the spirogyra. One, I said it is named for its beautiful spiral chloroplast. Possession of beautiful possession of beautiful spiral chloroplasts. Yes, that is one. Then they consist of thin unbranched chains. Consists of thin unbranched chain, thin unbranched chains of consists of thin unbranched chain of cylindrical cells of cylindrical cells. Yes. That's thin on branching of cylindrical cells, and the cells of the filament possess large central vacuole. Yes, possession of large central vacuole. Possession of large central vacuole. Yes, because it is a plant like a. Uh, it is a plant. As it is that is why it is having a chloroplast so it is like a plant cell it has central large vacuole where the nucleus is suspended by the cytoplasm where the nucleus it is in the central vacuole that the nucleus is suspended where the nucleus is suspended by the cytoplasm Yes. Also, the spirogyra reproduce both asexually. Yes, reproduction. Is both asexual and sexual. Asexually, it reproduces by fragmentation. Asexually, it reproduces by fragmentation, while well, sexually, it reproduces by conjugation. Sexually, it reproduces by conjugation. So that is how it reproduces. Fragmentation of the filament is done asexually, and then the uh, well, that is when the cells of the fish, the cell uh, fission of the cells containing the zygote, and then sexually it is having uh, the the conjugation. In conjugation, will be having two of this. Will be having two of this lying side by side. There will be one here, and there will be another somewhere around here, so that there is going to be a bridge between. The cells between the cell membrane of this particular body and the one that is here. So there's going to be something we call the, uh, we call that uh, that thing. We call it a bridge, and so that bridge is what carries or passes the uh, nucleus and every content of one particular cell into the other. 
So that is what uh, the spirogyra is. So uh, they are mostly found in fresh water as well. Mostly found. In fresh water, usually attached to submerged rocks. Attached to submerged rocks. Yes, they are found in uh, waters attached to submerged rocks and rook and wood. Or they can be seen as scum on stagnant water. Or as scum on stagnant water. Yes. So that is how we see the uh, the spirogyra. They are free floating microscopic uh, organisms. Yes. Free floating. Microscopic Microscopic Organisms Yes, yeah, so they are free floating uh, microscopic species and serve as food. They serve as food for some uh, aquatic organism. Serve as food for some microscopic organisms. So that is what we have for the spirogyra. You can see this is what the spirogyra looks like. This is another example of the spirogyra. So this is what we refer to as a filament of spirogyra. You can see here we have the paranoid, which is the filament. And in the, in the filament is where we have the, this is called the vacuole. Are we seeing it? The vacuole that houses uh, the cytoplasmic strand. The vacuole here carrying the cytoplasmic strand and there in it is where we have the nucleus of the spirogyra. So that is that about spirogyra. The next specimen we have now is our specimen F. And specimen F is muco or rhizopor. Specimen F, which is muco or rhizopor. Muko or rhizopus. Yes, that is our specimen F. So, what do we have to say about specimen F, which is muko or rhizopus? Let us quickly see. Okay, it's classification now. Kingdom. It's kingdom. It's fungi. Then we have the uh, phylum to be uh, zygomycola yes originally it's a uh, scientific name we have it to be uh, muko misedo muko misedo that is the botanical name for the botanical name for muko or Rhizopus. So, what are they? Uh, muko, well, slightly, muko is uh, different from uh, rhizopus. They have a very, very thin uh, difference, but they are both filamentous uh, or uh, fungi. They are both filamentous, filamentous fungi. Yes. And the member of the class uh, Phycomyces. Their class, okay, let me just put that one here. Phycomyces. 
FICO mindset. Uh, yes, both are common. They are saprophytic uh, organisms. They are saprophytic fungi that attack a variety of foodstuffs. Yes, they are saprophytic fungi. that affects different food stuff yes so muko is a microbial mold yes muko is a microbe is a microbial mold Oh, a microbial mold. Mold. That is what muko is. It is a microbial mold, and it affects food. Uh, its family. Okay. I was listening to family gradually. The family is mukoraceae. Sorry. Uh. Let me correct that spelling. So the family is Mukurasi. That is the family of uh, the Rhizopus. So uh, I said they are commonly found in the soils, yes, digestive systems and on plant surfaces. They are also found on some cheese, some rotten uh, vegetables, etc. So that is how we have them. Now, uh, okay, let me quickly put that here. I said they are commonly found, commonly found in soils commonly found in soils digestive systems digestive systems on plants plant surfaces on plant surfaces they are also found on some cheese On some cheese, rotten vegetables, rotten vegetables, etc. So those are where the places we can find them. The major difference between muko and rhizopod is that muko does not have rhizoid and stolons. That's the major difference. Major difference. Major difference between muko and rhizome or rhizoid, the rhizopus rather. Is that muko does not have what we refer to as the rhizoids and stolon. So I have taken the liberty of getting some uh, charts that can help to understand the differences between them. So this is what a mold looks like. You can see mold on a particular food sample. Uh, you can see it. This is how the rhizopus here. We have mold here. Let's see. This is this is it. You have you can see it. See it growing on the food. So this is how it looks when it is viewed microscopically. When you view it under microscope, 
because it is a it is a microorganism it cannot be seen with the naked eyes but when you view it with the microscope you will see something that looks like this huh so this is the rhizopus are we together so when you look at them when you check you see it looking like this this is how it's at the earliest onset of the appearance of the of the mold on the food this is how it appears so you can see here i i gave us uh the differences between uh the muko and the rhizopo differences between muko and rhizopo you can see muko here versus rhizopos are we together so the definition as that i said Muko is a fungi which does not have rhizoid structures and stolons but performs both asexual and sexual reproduction for its survival while the rhizopus is a fungi which has the rhizoid and the stolon and performs both sexual and asexual reproduction that is the major difference between the muko and the rhizopus so we can look at the morphological appearance the rhizoid the stolon which is absent in the rhizome and the stolon which is absent in the muko you can see that that is still what we are talking about here that the uh, rhizoid and the stolon they are absent in the muco, but they are both present in the rhizopus. The morphological appearance for the muco it uh, appears to be white to gray in color and looks like a cotton candy. But for the rhizopus, it has black color and looks like cotton candy as well. And then the features in uh, the sporangiospore. This one for the muco it is branched, but for the rhizopus it is unbranched. So that is how it appears are we together so we can see we can see it this is mold you mm? can see it's having uh the patches of uh discoloration so that is what the mold is about uh, for muko and the rhizopo so our next specimen that i'll be talking about now is specimen g which is granite seedling specimen g Specimen G. Granite seedling. That is what our specimen G is. So what is granite seedling? And what do we have to say about uh, the granite seedling? The granite seedling is an arachis. Yes, it is from the family, uh, the kingdom Plantae, and the family is Fabaceae. That is the family of kingdom uh, of this uh, particular species. The family is Arachae. So we have it to be a dicot. All right, let me quickly put those down. I said that the botanical name. Yes, it is a plant, so it can be called the botanical name. It is Arachis ipoge. Arachis hypogee. Sorry. Arachis hypogee. Yes, that is what the botanical name for ground nuts is. So we said that I said it is a dicot. Yes, it is a dicot. It is a dicot, a dicotyledonous plant. It is a dicotyledonous plant. So we said that this is a dicotyledonous plant. Sorry, let me quickly correct this. That cut ledonous plant, it is also a legume. Yes, it is a legume. Now, its germination is hypogeal, it has an hypogeal germination. Germination hypogeal that means because we have two types of germination, we have, I mean, basically, we can say three, but majorly, we have uh, two. We have the hypogeal, we have the epigeal, and we also have the viviparous germination, but let us stick with the hypogeal and the epigeal germination. For the hypogeal germination, 
the seed leaf remains in the soil. The seed leaf of the plant remains in the soil, and that is the example that we find in the uh, the ground nut. So it is a a a dicotyledonous plant, meaning it has two seed leaves. Possession of two seed leaves. It is also a legume, very very rich in uh, protein and uh, uh, it is a fibrous uh, root also. And then you said that uh, its germination is hypogeal. Also, we said that the seed remains in the soil. Uh, examples, we can have other examples like we have uh, pea, we have mango, we have wheat, rice, uh, all of this. They are propagated, uh, particularly this granite, it is propagated by seed. Propagated by seed. Yes, that is how it is being propagated. Now it is planted for human consumption. Planted for human consumption. Yes, that is why it is being planted. Also, it can be used for uh, livestock forage. And livestock forage. That is why it is being planted. It is an annual plant, yes. And so it completes its life cycle in one planting season. Completes life cycle in one planting season. So this is an example of what uh the uh this is an example of what I, uh, the arachis ipoge is mm, granite we can see the roots so this is what it looks like you can see the flowers and then the seed so let me show us a clearer picture you can see this one here you can see the plant and you can see the pod that has the seed in it let me okay this is what the pod looks like you can see the pod i'm sure you are familiar with this so inside here we now have uh the fruit or the seed you can see this is the pod when you open the pod you have the seed inside inside it so that is what it looks like are we together so this is how the plant looks and it is uh hypogee in nature so if you are told to draw the leaf because we are told to present uh a seedling that is a, a, a week old seedling so you probably be talking about you be having the leaf Pro not the seed but the leaf so you need to get familiarized with the leaf you know how to draw the leaves you know how to draw the plant this is how it looks so please uh familiarize yourself with that and this is the the seed so the next specimen we'll be looking at now is our specimen h specimen h let me put it here specimen H which happens to be maize specimen H is maize so that is uh, the next thing we want to talk about now so what is the maize let me see the botanical name for maize we have is to be Z maize Z maize is the botanical name it is also it is also uh okay its own family is uh, uh it is a gramine yeah it is a gramine family yes the kingdom is kingdom plantae for it for sure and it is a gramine the family okay kingdom plantae for this one as well the kingdom is plantae and then we have it to be the family is uh we have the gramine that is its uh the gramine that is its family where it belongs to now uh the one major difference between these two specimens here because they are both they both have the same type of germination but one major difference between them is that this here is a monocot. 
It is a monocotyledonous plant. That means it has one seed leaf. It has one seed leaf. It is a uh, it is a uh, a monocotyledonous plant. It is not a legume, unlike the specimen G. The specimen G is a legume, but specimen E is not a legume. This particular one is a cereal. Is it cereal? Yes. Uh, also, we said that its germination, its germination is hypogeal in nature. Yes, it has hypogeal germination in nature. It is also propagated. Well, yes, it is propagated by seed as well. Propagated by seed. Yes. Now, it is also planted for human consumption as well as for uh well it is a grain so it can be fed to uh some uh animals like the birds yes it is also an annual uh crop yes planted for human consumption and poultry also it is annual it is an annual plant so we can see the uh the very characteristics that we need to look at in that so this is what the uh maize plant look like the young seedling of the maize plant this is what it looks like so you can see it now this is if you are told to draw but adventure you are told to draw the longitudinal section of a maize seed this is how it is going to look like so this is the uh the vertical section or the longitudinal section of a maize seed we can see it the seed coat and the fruit wall you can see the aluron layer uh the endosperm is here we have the the scutellum here the plumule is here the radical and the, uh, the cholerizer all of those are found in this particular picture so paraventure you are told to draw the seed the cut of the seed uh longitudinal cut of the seed this is what you should be looking at drawing are we together so let us see our next specimen now is specimen we have talked about uh h our next specimen is specimen i which is the microscope specimen i microscope Now, this is an instrument that is used majorly in the lab and it is used to view microorganisms, organisms that cannot be seen with the naked eyes. Used to view organisms or things that are very small things that cannot be seen with the naked eyes so that is what the microscope is so it is used to view objects that are very very small yes now microscope has several parts some of the parts uh, will be shown in this diagram that we have here we can see these are examples of a uh, microscope so we said that uh, microscope we have just uh, explained what microscopes are so what do we now see what do we see to what microscopes are now i've said this is a microscope or these are microscopes and they are uh, they have been drawn well labeled so let us quickly see there are different types of microscope types so we have we are, let's see let me just list them we have the simple the simple microscope we have the compound 
microscope we have the electron microscope we have the electron microscope we have the stereo microscope as well as the scanning probe microscope scanning probe microscope so those are the type of microscopes that we have those are examples of the type of microscopes that we have but the major ones that we have the major microscopes that we have we have the simple microscope and the compound microscope and those are the ones that you can see drawn here this is a simple microscope this is a compound microscope now they are done they are used uh, to view tiny objects like I've said earlier on now the use of these microscopes requires certain other materials which we will eventually talk about but let me just quickly make mention of some of the parts of the microscope here is what we refer to as the handle we have the the the, the handle here and at this place here we have the eyepiece that is where the eye is being put like you can see here or it is also called the ocular lens that is where we have the eye it is a lens that is found here mm -hmm. so this one is uh one lens and this one has by there are two lenses so the eyes are put here and so it will be used to view the object now this place here like i said is the uh the 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 high then we have this place as the arm you can see this place here is the arm and then we have different types of knobs fine adjustment knob and coarse adjustment knob like you can see here this is a fine adjustment knob mm? so this one here it is a uh, two that is attached together the one inside is the fine adjustment knob the one outside is the coarse adjustment knob so you first of all adjust the coarse adjustment knob then the fine adjustment knob is also adjusted to get a clearer view of the object that you are viewing here is the nose piece that carries the uh, objective lenses the nose piece that carries the objective lenses in some microscope you have three objective lenses or majorly you have three objective lenses in the microscopes so like you can see here also the nose piece it carries the objective lens and the objective lenses are uh, different they have different uh, magnifying uh, powers the objective lenses have different magnifying powers and then we have the stage here here is where we have the stage and if you look closely there are two pins on the stage which is called the stage clip they are called clips because they help they help to hold the thing that is put on the stage here this is uh, this thing here we can see them at this tiny point here they are called the stage clip let me use this point here you can see this metal this flat metal on the stage this one's here they are called the stage clips now on that stage there is something called a slide that is being put on the stage to actually carry the uh, organism that we want to view so on the stage in the middle of the stage is a hole if you look closely you have a hole there that hole is the aperture it carries it it, it permits light from the illuminator light from the light source into the stage so it is through that aperture that light gets to the stage so that the objective lenses can have the uh, object clearly viewed so we have the condenser under the stage and the uh, the iris or the diaphragm then the illuminator or the light source and this is the base of the microscope as you can see this is the base of the microscope and this is the illuminator or the light source now depending on the type of microscope that you are talking about or that you are using we have some of these microscopes that we actually make use of uh, uh reflected ray let me use that they make use of what reflected ray so that means at this place here where we have illuminator what you'll be having there is going to be a mirror in the normal in the simple microscope you'll be having a mirror here so the mirror is going to have a light shown on it and it is going to reflect it into the eye uh the aperture of the of the microscope so that the light can go up to the uh, direction of the uh, objective lens 
but for this particular type of microscope it is using uh illumination that is light from a light source so the light goes straight into the uh aperture of the microscope so that is what the uh, microscope is about so how do we make use of the microscope the use of microscope now is what we want to look at so if you have to look at the use of microscope there are several things that you need to look at or that you need to look into they are very very simple number one is that you have the uh okay let's start from let's start from this how to use the, the, the microscope you connect the microscope to a light source or a power source after which you turn the revolving nose piece so that the lowest objective lens is in position of the aperture and then you mount the specimen on the stage this is what i'm talking about this is what i'm saying that the first thing to do is to put on the light here is the switch if you look closely now we have the switch here so when you apply the switch when you uh put the switch on then you have the opportunity to uh turn the revolving nose piece this place here this nose piece you can rotate it so that you have the objective lens to view directly on you can see this particular one is directly on this part here so that is what we are saying so you turn the objective the nose piece rather to have the objective lens with the smaller or the smallest power viewing directly on the uh the aperture and then you mount the specimen on the stage i will show you very soon how to mount specimen on the stage so you mount the specimen on the stage this is the stage here so you mount the specimen on it after which you use the metal clips these clips here you can see the stage clip are we together this one's here you use them to hold firmly to hold the object firmly or the slides firmly to the stage and then you make sure that the specimen is positioned in the center right under the lowest objective lens and then the next thing to do is to look into the eyepiece that's the aperture here you look into the eyepiece this place here this eyepiece you look into them and you slowly rotate the coarse adjustment knob that's the first one you rotate this one on the outside this bigger one that's the one you rotate so you rotate it depending on the object you are viewing it could be clockwise or anti-clockwise you rotate it and when you have an image gathered on the slide then you start using the fine adjustment knob that is the next thing to do after which you you use the fine adjustment knob adjust the condenser for the maximum amount yes the condenser here you adjust it it is also uh, rotating so you adjust it for the maximum amount of light that is allowed to pass through from the light source or the illuminator to the stage and then the next thing is now you slowly rotate the fine adjustment knob this one here you slowly rotate it to obtain a clearer image of the specimen and then you have the opportunity to examine your specimen after you're done viewing with the lowest power you can change the objective lens to a more uh suitable magnifying power and then you proceed to the highest power of the objective lens so that is what uh this is about the use of microscope now it is also important that we understand that there is if we are using microscope we still need to understand that there is the need to know how to care for a microscope so few things that can be done to care for the microscope i have listed the parts of the microscope the base the arm the stage the illuminator the diaphragm the body tube condenser lens and the rest of those so how do you care for your microscope number one is never hold the microscope right let me put some of this down right so you number one you hold the microscope by the piece support the stand and the and hold the arm when carrying the instrument around always carry the microscope upright as the eyepiece could fall off anytime then the illuminator must be turned off when it is not in use no, then you can use a non-solvent cleaning solution to avoid damage to the lenses use a microfiber to Yes, use a microfiber now to clean the lens, the area of the uh, of the of the microscope, 
as well as using uh, a cover or a jacket to cover it to prevent it from just dust while also you can use the microscope do not rush through the viewing process be careful when handling the knobs so these are the things that we have to 